All right, welcome to Lovings Reads Lovecraft. At Thrift Town, I bought The House of the Seven Gables because I forgot to bring a book. There's usually a long line, so I bring a book while I wait to buy my items. I forgot my book, so I bought a book in case there was a long line. I didn't get a chance to read any of it. Here's a stupid Santa Claus. In my art studio anymore. The Art of Star Wars Comics, 100 collectible postcards. If I get kicked out of my art studio, I don't want to lose that. Robert Crumb's Heroes of Blues, Jazz, and Country. It's a good book. Good illustrations. Took him a long time to do this. Comes with a CD. It's a good CD. I highly recommend this book. Look, sure. It's a good one. Uh, Common Ground, the love issue. I just have it for the John Lennon pictures. Oh, this is stupid. this dog much but I need a guard dog while wow, thrift town years ago I regretted not buying a bag of regular logo Legos for about five bucks that was a big mistake but I got these ones the board for it is um, buried so it's nice to get some more of those blocks to build dungeons Box world. Don't want to lose this book. Then I could lose everything if I miss payments on the storage unit. South Park Cat. I don't want to lose that. And this was a score. A Pillsbury Doughboy thing. Sometimes uh, Thrift Town has these. Uh, name brand items like this that no one wants but this is gold and now all I need is a Ghostbusters car now that was a Stay Puft monster I don't know but same diff to me oh yeah I'm actually here to read a book fun part is showing all my toys and the trusty glasses so I don't F up. It's frustrating that I can't swear too much on YouTube. It was on the 21st. Oh, we're continuing with Beyond the Wall of Sleep. It was on the 21st of February, 1901. That the thing finally occurred. As I look back across the years, I realize how unreal it seems, and sometimes half wonder if old Dr. Fenton was not right when he charged it, charged it all to my excited imagination. I recall that he listened with great kindness and patience when I told him, but afterward gave me a nerve powder and arranged for the half year's vacation on which I departed the next week. That fateful night I was wildly agitated and perturbed. For despite the excellent care he had received, Joe Slater was unmistakably dying. Perhaps it was his mountain freedom that he missed, or perhaps the turmoil in his brain had grown too acute for his rather sluggish physique. But at all events, the, the flame of vitality flickered low in the decadent body. He was drowsy near the end, and as darkness fell, he dropped off into a troubled sleep. I did not strap on the straitjacket as was customary when he slept, since I saw that he was too feeble to be dangerous, even if he woke in mental disorder once more. 
before passing away. But I did place upon his head and mine the two ends of my cosmic radio, hoping against hope for a first and last message from the dream world in the brief time remaining. In the cell with us was one nurse, a mediocre fellow who did not understand the purpose of the apparatus or think to inquire into my course. As hours wore on, I saw his head droop awkwardly in sleep, but I did not disturb him. I myself, lulled by the rhythmical, rhythmical breathing of the healthy and the dying man, must have nodded a little later. The sound of weird lyric melody was what aroused me. Chords, vibrations, and harmonic ecstasies echoed passionately on every hand. While on my ravished sight burst the stupendous spectacle of ultimate beauty. Walls, columns, and architraves of living architraves of living fire blazed effulgently around the spot where I seemed to float in air, extending upward to an infinitely high vaulted dome of indescribable splendor. Blending with this display of palatial magnificence, or rather supplanting it at times in kaleidoscopic rotation, were glimpses of wide plains and graceful valleys, high mountains and inviting grottos covered with every lovely attribute of scenery which my delighted eye could conceive of yet formed wholly of some glowing ethereal plastic entity which in consistency partook as much of spirit as of matter as i gazed i perceived that my own brain held the key to these enchanting metamorphosis metamorphosis for each vista which appeared to me was the one my changing mind most wished to behold. Amidst this Elysian realm, I dwelt not as a stranger, for each sight and sound was familiar to me, just as it had been for uncounted eons of eternity before, and would be for like eternities to come and would be for like eternities to come. Then the resplendent aura of my brother of light drew near and held colloquy with me, soul to soul, with silent and perfect interchange of thought. The hour was one of approaching triumph, for was not my fellow being escaping at last from a degrading periodic bondage, escaping forever and preparing to follow the accursed oppressor even unto the uttermost fields of ether that upon it might be wrought a flaming cosmic vengeance which would shake the spheres we floated thus for a little time when i perceived a slight blurring and fading of the objects around us as though some force were recalling me to earth where i least wished to go the form near me seemed to feel a change also for it gradually brought its discourse toward a conclusion and itself prepared to quit the scene fading from my sight at a rate somewhat less rapid than that of the other objects a few more thoughts were exchanged and i knew that the luminous one and i were being recalled to bondage Though for my brother of light, it would be the last time. The sorry planet shell being well nigh spent in less than an hour, my fellow would be free to pursue the oppressor along the Milky Way and pass the hither stars to the very confines of infinity. A well-defined shock separates my final impression of the fading scene of light from my sudden and somewhat shamefaced awakening and straightening up in my chair as I saw the dying figure on the couch more move hesitantly. Joe Slater was indeed awaking, though probably for the last time. As I looked more closely, I saw that in the sallow cheeks shone spots of color 
which had never before been present. The lips, too, seemed unusual, being tightly compressed, as if by the force of a stronger character than had been Slater's. The whole face finally began to grow tense, and the head turned restlessly with closed eyes. I did not arouse the sleeping nurse, but readjusted the slightly disarranged headbands of my telepathic radio intent to catch any parting message the dreamer might have to deliver. All at once the head turned sharply in my direction and the eyes fell open causing me to stare in blank amazement at what I beheld. The man who had been Joe Slater, the cat skill decadent, was now gazing at me with a pair of luminous expanded eyes whose blue seemed subtly to have deepened. Neither mania nor degeneracy was visible in that gaze, and I felt beyond a doubt that I was viewing a face behind which lay an active mind of high order. At this juncture, my brain became aware of a steady external influence operating upon it. I closed my eyes to concentrate my thoughts more profoundly and was rewarded by the positive knowledge that my long sought mental message had come at last. Each transmitted idea formed rapidly in my mind. And though no actual language was employed, my habitual association of conception and expression was so great that I seemed to be receiving a message in ordinary English. Joe Slater is dead, came the sole petrifying voice or agency from beyond the wall of sleep. My opened eyes sought the couch of pain and curious horror, but the blue eyes were still calmly gazing and the countenance was still intelligently animated. He is better dead for he was unfit to bear the active intellect of cosmic entity. His gross body could not undergo the needed adjustments between ethereal life and planet life. It was too much of an animal, too little a man, yet it is through his deficiency that you have come to discover me. For the cosmic and planet souls rightly should never meet. He has been my torment and diurnal prison for 42 of your terrestrial years. I am an entity like that which you yourself become in the freedom of dreamless sleep. I am your brother of light and have floated with you in the effulgent valleys. It is not permitted me to tell your waking earth self of your real self. But we are all roamers of vast spaces and travelers in many ages. Next year I may be dwelling in the dark Egypt which you call ancient or in the cruel empire of Tsan Chan which is to come 3,000 years hence. You and I have drifted to the worlds that reel about the red Arcturus and dwelt in the bodies of the insect philosophers. I crawl proudly over the fourth moon of Jupiter. How little does the Earth self know of life and its extent? How little indeed ought it to know for its own tranquility? Of the oppressor I cannot speak. You on Earth have unwittingly felt its distant presence. You who, without knowing, idly gave to its blinking beacon the name of Algol, the demon star. It is to meet and conquer the oppressor that I have vainly striven for eons, held back by bodily encumbrances. Tonight, I go as a nemesis bearing just and blazingly cataclysmic vengeance. Watch me in the sky close by the demon star. I cannot speak longer, for the body of Joe Slater grows cold and rigid, and the coarse brains are ceasing to vibrate as I wish. You have been my friend in the cosmos. You have been my only friend on this planet. The only soul to sense and seek for me within the repellent form which lies on this couch. We shall meet again, perhaps in the shining mists of Orion's sword, perhaps on a bleak plateau in prehistoric Asia, perhaps in unremembered dreams tonight, perhaps in some other form in Aeon hence when the solar system shall have been swept away. 
At this point, the thought waves abruptly seized, and the pale eyes of the dreamer, or can I say dead man, commenced to glaze fishily. In a half stupor, I crossed over the couch and felt of his wrist, but found it cold, stiff, and pulseless. The sallow cheeks paled again, and the thick lips fell open, disclosing the repulsively rotten fangs of the degenerate Joe Slater. I shivered, pulled a blanket over the hideous face, and awakened the nurse. Then I left the cell and went silently to my room. I had an insistent and unaccountable craving for a sleep whose dreams I should not remember. The climax? What plain tale of science can boast of such a rhetorical effect? I have merely set down certain things appealing to me as facts, allowing you to construe them as you will. As I have already admitted, my superior, old Dr. Fenton, denies the reality of everything I have related. He vows that I was broken down with nervous strain and badly in need of the long vacation on full pay which he so generously gave me. He assures me on his professional honor that Joe Slater was but a low-grade paranoiac, paranoiac whose fantastic notions must have come from the crude hereditary folk tales which circulate in even the most decadent of communities. All this he tells me, yet I cannot forget what I saw in the sky on the night after Slater died. Lest you think me a biased witness, another's pen must add this final testimony, which may perhaps supply the climax you expect. I will quote the following account of the star Nova Persei, verbatim from the pages of that eminent astronomical authority, Professor Garrett P. Service. On February 22, 1901, a marvelous new star was discovered by Dr. Anderson of Edinburgh, not very far from Al Algol. No star, no star had been visible at that point before. Within 24 hours, the stranger had become so bright that it outshone Capella. In a week or two, it had visibly faded, and in the course of a few months, it was hardly discernible with the naked eye. Thanks for listening.